So my part's probably going to be more serious than his part, uh, because I really feel very strongly about this. Um, though I have to admit, I'm much more impressed with Dr. Badia's graphical capabilities than off-pump capabilities. But nevertheless, we'll go ahead and switch this over to mine. And I'll go ahead and continue. Um, here it is. OK. OK, so first of all, uh, my statement is off-pump cabbage does have a place, though very infrequent and very uh, 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 special circumstances. However, I believe it is overused, overmarketed, and based on current data should be considered as an alternative not as a first choice. Vis-a-vis -vis somebody has a porcelain aorta, you're not going to be putting them on bypass. I get that. All right. Um, OpCab is not less expensive. Those retractors, those stabilizers, probably cost fifteen hundred to grand. Cardiopulmonary bypass circuit costs somewhere in the neighborhood of six hundred dollars. So it's not less expensive. They try to say that the patient's in the hospital less, not on the bed later as long, but we'll look at the data and let you all decide. My goal, however, is to convince my esteemed opponent that he too, like the rest of the country, should abandon off-pump cabbage except in highly selected circumstances. So despite what he's going to tell you, it's not, we won't pump for food, okay, so we're not worried about this, it's just an economic issue. Our pump does not look like that of Dr. John Gibbon and his wonderful wife Mary, the first perfusionist with the IBM uh, Model 1. Uh, we don't do this when you're talking to us. I don't do my cases like this or like this unless it's your off-pump case. Perfusion school does not teach us to be guerrilla fighters. It does not make me a jihadist. Uh, so moving on to Columbia Presbyterian Hospital in New York, this is an advert that they have online and they talk about how 95% of the primary coronary, coronary revest performed by some surgeons at Columbia Medical University. It's, it's really marketing is what it comes down to. But here's Dr. Uh, Craig Smith, right? Yeah, Craig Smith and the team from New York Presbyterian Hospital talking about this man's operation Eh, they put them on pump. So apparently Dr. Smith is either not one of the surgeons that does 95% of the cases or somebody thought, you know, let's do it the way we know works well and we get a good graft and there's not any problems. So um, there have been surgeons and articles written that support off pump and this one, just the stuff in yellow is kind of the part that I want you to highlight on in this particular case. Uh, Dr. Puskis says that uh, off-pump coronary artery bypass grafting is associated with lower operative mortality than coronary artery bypass grafting on pump for higher risk patients, and that this mortality benefit seems to increase with increasing predicted risk of mortality uh, by STS scoring. Well, I I I'm just going to tell you, I fundamentally agree disagree completely with that statement. I'm going to kind of explain a little further on. That article, by the way, was written and published in October. Interestingly enough, a month later, I wonder if there was some politics there, the New, World, New England Journal published this article at one year follow-up patients in the off-pump group had worse composite outcomes and poorer graft patency than did patients in the on-pump group. No significant difference between the techniques were found in neurocognitive, neuropsychological outcomes and so forth and so on, or use of major uh, resources. Also, uh, Dr. Brillum states here that studies conducted during the 90s pointed to a possible decline in neurocognitive and motor functioning after on-pump cabbage. That was, the, that was the pump head issue that was put into the uh, Wall Street Journal. Nearly killed our profession. But what they found really was it wasn't the pump. Now, it might have been the you know, IBM you know, Model 1. It might have been those old bubble oxygenators that we used. You know, But today, eh. We're using membranes, whole different, whole different phenomenon. And I actually have to compliment the off-pump surgeons because because of them, manufacturers have seriously stepped up their game and it's caused us to do the same thing and make a better pump system uh, for our patients. But this is really the culprit. You look here at this athroma in the aorta, this is not uncommon. 
And it occurs when you put the cross clamp on, you remove the cross clamp, or the partial side biting clamp on to do the proximals if you don't do a single uh, clamp technique. And you remove that, and if you're not using some kind of intraortic filtration and this kind of stuff is floating around in there, well, it's going somewhere. It's gonna go to the brain, it's gonna go to the kidneys, it's gonna go to the, somewhere, it's gonna cause a problem. So here's the off-pump stabilizers you see there, expensive little tools. Here you see how anesthesia has become really quite good at producing a blood pressure, which you see there, 113 over 74, heart rate's 55, probably on some Esmolol, looks great. But look at that CVP of 26. That's probably not that good. Let's see what this, this is an actual patient. Those, that's the actual patient with stabilizers. This is that patient's actual readings from the radial arterial line. And here is that patient's cerebral oximetry numbers. A lot of people don't use cerebral oximetry. I think it should be used on every single case without fail. But look at those numbers. If you don't have it and it's not there, well, it's just not there. Got a good blood pressure, everything's fine. So this article by Dr. Lazar, I strongly, in circulation, strongly recommend everyone get this article and read it. It is fascinating, very well done, probably the best article I've ever read. And I've taken several excerpts out of this article where he's reviewed the entire body of work that's been published on on-pump versus off-pump surgery. He argues that the primary focus of surgical coronary revascularization is complete revascularization and of the uh, uh, technically perfect anastomosis. Of course, that's gonna make a difference in patency rates, okay? Under all circumstances, on all patients, at all institutions, regardless of their cardiac volume. You know, the Med Center does a lot of cases but most surgery done in the United States is done in community hospitals. Everybody has to be able to do this technically perfect. We must not forget that the patients are sent for surgical revas because medical management has failed. Their cardiologists believe that stents not a good option and these goals can be best achieved with on pump cabbage surgery. Dr. Robert Cohen had a very different view and he said, I don't doubt that I have treated some patients with off-pump surgery where if I had put them on pump, I would have killed them. However, shortly thereafter, he wrote this. At one point, Dr. Cohn said, his group was performing up to 90% of cardiac surgeries with OPCAB, but now do just 10%. He states in here that there's no reduction, in, no reduction in morbidity or mortality to show that it's better and it is very difficult to teach the residents as well as incomplete revascularization and poorer anastomoses. A lot of extra proline getting thrown for all those leaks. In this particular article, uh, they examined the effect of incomplete revascularization. If you had one, it was a problem. You had two, it was an even bigger problem. Furthermore, incomplete revascularization was more common in the off-pump group. Again, in patients with three-vessel disease, survival was significantly less after op-cap procedures. Okay? Especially detrimental in older patients, greater than 75, and results in significant decrease in long-term survival. But you'll hear surgeons say, oh, the patient's really old. I don't think he can tolerate this. So we're going to pull his heart over, decrease his coronary perfusion, decrease his systemic perfusion, bleed out, and struggle through an, a, an anastomosis that we want to stay open and work. Doesn't make sense to me. Uh, patients who require conversion. This I found fascinating. In most analyses of OPCAD patients, data have not been analyzed with the intention to treat principle, meaning if you were in the op-cab group but had to convert, you suddenly fell into the on-pump arm. After you may have had an event that caused them to have to convert, that probably doesn't make a lot of sense. 
Okay, and it says here decreased ejection fraction in patients who undergo uh, surgery under emergent or salvage conditions are more likely to require conversion to on-pump cabbage. Exactly. The patient's got a decreased ejection fraction. Why would you not put that patient on bypass and rest their heart while you do the anastomoses? Does OPCAD limit the detrimental effects associated? And this is, of course, the inflammatory process. Well, it's very clear by reading this that you have complement activation, yes, from the, uh, from the pump. That could somewhat be attenuated if you do aggressive CVVH, you know, get out the evil humors, the cytokines, the bad interleukins, and all that kind of stuff. But complement is also produced just simply from some kind of ischemia. So inflammatory processes occur as soon as you saw the sternum. So I'm not sure what you're, what you're doing. And then, of course, things we all know, avoiding suction, using Keppard bonded circuits, miniature circuits, so forth and so on, negate the detrimental effects of CPB. And I think we're all there. Most people have priming volumes of six, seven, 800 cc's at most. They wrap, they use ultrafiltration, they do all kinds of fancy things to make the cardiopulmonary bypass system much safer than it was years ago. We don't live in a vacuum. So you're comparing off-pump to on-pump surgery, but you're comparing the off-pump using tools for the perfusion that are antiquated. Doesn't seem to make sense. In this study here, uh, looking at neurocognitive function, I'm just gonna graze over this slide, but basically it says the same thing. There's really no difference. It's not the pump causing the problem. <clears throat> quality of life, failed to demonstrate improvements in quality of life over on-pump cabbage, again. In this particular study, looking at sex, renal transplant recipients, and the elderly, female patients undergoing OPCAB were significantly less likely to have received complete revascularization. Supporters of OPCAB have claimed that this technique limits renal dysfunction. It, in fact, has not. And the authors concluded, despite the avoidance of CPB, OPCAB resulted in no improvement in patient survival or renal allograft function compared with on pump. And they actually took these patients who had kidney transplants and used them in their uh, research model. Looking at the um, elderly, again, same thing. The older you are, the worse it is to actually do your case off pump. It's not better. Now, you might not want to clamp the aorta and rest the heart. I can live with that. But doing it off, off pump, bad idea. So should OPCAB be abandoned for coronary revascularization? In the words of Dr. Lazar, these goals can be best achieved with on-pump cabbage surgery. The data derived from numerous studies worldwide clearly demonstrate that the OPCAB has failed to meet these goals unless individual surgeons can demonstrate that they can achieve short and long-term outcomes with OPCAB that are comparable to on-pump cabbage results. They should abandon this technique. My goal is to try to get my esteemed colleague to abandon his off-pump technique. So I advocate for a hybrid resting heart. I think every patient having heart surgery should have cerebral oximetry. I think every patient that goes on bypass, that they're going to be cross, whether cross them the or not, you have a cannula in there, use intraaortic filtration, manipulating the aorta. It will absolutely help you reduce your neurocognitive dysfunction, stroke rate, renal failure rate, and everything else. I strongly, strongly believe in intraaortic filtration. So let's look at the STS data. 2008, 21.4% of cases, coroner, isolated cabbage, were done off pump. Fast forward to 2014, last year, 14.7%. That is a trend and a fairly dramatic one, in my opinion. So don't believe me, believe instead your own eyes. There it goes. Okay, go ahead and flip it back on. Okay, so let's take a look at this, okay? Obviously, the one on the right is on pump, nice, clear, dry, dry, quiet feel. And there on the left, you see the blood bath. Dr. Lumpson, do you like that? Do you like that blood loss? Massive. Heard it all. Massive blood loss. This is the same surgeon, same surgery team, and the Patients were matched with the same size LAD, same size mammary, same operative team, everything was the same. Look at how beautiful they're using that reverse pot and making that incision. I mean, I mean that, that cut, phenomenal. And here, you can't see. They have to get out the, uh, 
the uh, uh, gas blower. See him right there. So I'm going to fast forward through a little of this just to help you. No, look at it. Watch him try to cut. Watch him try to cut. Look, look, look. Does that look technically, does that look precise? That looks like a close guess. Okay. So let's, let's I'm going to fast forward just a little bit. Let's watch him take some bites. Oh, grabbing the heart to be able okay. to get adequate exposure. Yeah, we don't have to listen to. Now let's just watch. Now look at there. Look at there. Watch when he comes around. Now he's gonna take. He's gonna take this bite. Here he goes. Look. Look at the one on the left. Yep. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Come on. 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 You can make. It. You get it. You get it. You get it. You can get it. You get it. Come, oh. uh, that's about a 10 millimeter bite. Look at the one on the right. At how easy that is in comparison. It's just amazing. Which operation do you want? I know what I want. I want the one on the right, and I want one of you guys running my pump. Thank you very much.